Hi Tacoma, welcome back to your third grade TV classroom. Today is Friday, November 20th, and I'm Mrs. Oslin. As always, take a moment and check in with your zone. Think about what emotion you're feeling. Think about how strongly you're feeling your emotion and think about your I message. You'll remember your I message sounds like I feel hmm because hmm. Now I'm gonna model sharing my I message with Rafa. Rafa, I'm in the blue zone today because I'm feeling a little bit tired because I got woken up in the middle of the night and had a hard time falling back asleep. But I think I'm gonna be okay. Now you take a moment to share your iMessage with your learning buddy, someone in the room with you or with me on the screen. If you are recognizing that you are feeling your emotion really strongly, a four or a five on the feelings thermometer, you'll remember we have our stop and stay cool steps to help you get back into the green zone, ready to share your I message. You'll remember the stop and stay cool steps are, first, you say, I feel like I'm losing control. Second, you stop. Third, you give yourself a chili hug. Then you practice breathing in and out for five seconds and then you should be cool and ready for school, which means ready to share your I message. We've been talking a lot about finding win-win solutions to a conflict, and conflicts are normal and natural to have problems with someone else. And it's really important for us to maintain our relationships and our friendships that we find a win-win solution. And you'll remember a win-win solution is one in which both people get some of what they want and both people feel okay with the outcome. Now, if you are having a conflict with someone, we learned that you can use the peace path to help you solve that conflict in a non-violent way. Step one on the peace path is to tell the problem. This is where both people share their I message and both people get a chance to say back the I message so everyone involved knows how everyone feels and why. Step two on the peace path is to brainstorm solutions. This is where both people think about what possible win-win solutions are. And the win-win solutions that we've been learning about have been share, take turns, apologize, get help, or here, take turns, apologize, get help. What's the other one, third graders? Compromise, give a little. Then both people come together and have a conversation about what win-win solution they came up with and together you decide which one you're going to try. Now, today we're going to go back into our book about Cesar Chavez and before we do that, the materials that you are going to need are your new ELA packet, a pencil, and your learning buddy. So you gather those materials and then meet me back here. Are you ready? Okay. We've been starting our new unit about biography, and you'll remember that biographies are books about people's lives. And we learned about how writers select the subject of their biography on purpose. They usually pick someone who means a lot to them or inspires them or always someone who has done something important. And so today we're gonna to learn how writers of biography focus on important events in their subject's life and that the events in a biography are organized chronologically. Say chronologically. That means they're organized in the order that they happened. And so a biography is organized by time. And sometimes the chapters in a biography are representative of events in someone's life. 
Sometimes a biography is written more like a story, and that's like the two books that we've been reading, the one about Rosa Parks and then the one about Cesar Chavez. They're both written like stories, but we're going to pay attention to the events in our book and pay really close attention how they're in order from beginning to end, and that helps the readers really have a deep understanding of Cesar Chavez's life. Now, in order to help us today, you're going to, in your graph, or excuse me, in your ELA packet, you need to find this graphic organizer. It's chronological structure four, and it's on page 41, and the page numbers are really small at the bottom. So I put it bigger on this slide so that you can see. So find that page, and then at the top, where it says chronological structure four, you're gonna write Cesar Chavez's name. So go ahead and do that. Are you ready? Okay, so we're just gonna read some pages of our book and pay really close attention, like I said, to the important events that our author pulls out and pay attention to that they're organized in chronological order, which means in the order that they happened. And we're gonna use our graphic organizer to write in the boxes important events that happen in Cesar Chavez's life. And that's gonna help us as a reader to pay really close attention and remember the important events. Cesar Chavez was born on March 31st, 1927, near Yuma, Arizona. His parents, Librado and Juana Chavez, were farmers. Cesar was the second of their five children. Cesar's father was often too busy to spend time with his family. It was Cesar's mom who kept them together. She told her children stories, she taught them values, and many proverbs such, proverbs such as, what you do to others, others do to you. Now, that's the first event, is that Cesar Chavez was born on March 31st, 1927. So in our first box on our graphic organizer, that's what we're going to write. So you go ahead and do it on yours and I will do it on mine. Now, when we're using our graphic organizer to help us organize our thinking, we don't really have to worry about using complete sentences, and I wouldn't worry too much about checking your spelling. Just get your idea down. Now, as we continue to read, let's think about what are the really important events that our authors included, and we're gonna continue to fill in those events in our graphic organizer. Cesar Chavez grew up during the Great Depression. People everywhere lost their jobs. In 1938, Cesar's parents lost their farm and moved to California. Cesar's father soon found work for the family picking peas. They walked, bent over between the rows of plants. For a full hamper, 25 pounds of peas, they earned 25 cents. When the work on the farm was done, the family moved on. They picked string beans, lima beans, broccoli, lettuce, sugar beets, cauliflower, onions, carrots, tomatoes, cantaloupe, watermelon, and grapes. When the farm boss was especially unfair, or when work conditions were especially bad, Cesar's father said, okay, let's go, and they quit. Cesar Chavez later remembered, our dignity meant more than money. Now, I thought this was a really important event because it made me think of why Cesar Chavez got so involved in union work and in protecting farmers. And it was because of this example from his dad. And we learned that biographies often include the important events and people who influenced the subject. And I think that this page really um, spells out why Cesar Chavez fought the fight that he fought 
because his dad set that example for him. So I think that's a really important event to include on our graphic organizer. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. The Chavez family, like many others, had no real home. One winter, with nowhere else to go, they slept in a tent in a woman's yard. The family moved around so much that Cesar attended 65 elementary schools, some for just a day or a week. In 1942, after his father was hurt in a car accident, 15-year-old Cesar dropped out of school to earn money for his family. Now, I think that was a really significant event because that was when Cesar's formal education stopped and he had to go to work to support his family. So I'm gonna include that in my graphic organizer. And if you think that was a really important event, you can include it in your graphic organizer also. In 1944, in the midst of World War II, Cesar Chavez enlisted in the U.S. Navy. He served for two years. While on a short leave, he went to a movie theater in Delano, California. The theater was segregated. African Americans, Filipinos, and Mexicans were confined to a sec section on the right. Cesar Chavez felt this was wrong. He sat on the left and was arrested. In our own way, Chavez said later, my family had been challenging the growers for some time. Now he was challenging a theater owner. Now, I think this was a really significant event in Cesar's life. So I'm definitely gonna include it in my graphic organizer. In June 1952, Chavez met Fred Ross, who had been sent to San Jose by the community service organization CSO to register voters for the coming elections. He changed my life, Chavez said. Ross explained how in the United States, even poor people had power. They just needed to speak out to vote. Chavez was convinced and went door to door and urged people to register to vote. At first, he was so frightened he couldn't talk. Little by little, I got confidence, Chavez said later. In about three days, I was doing okay. Now, the author quotes Cesar Chavez and says, he changed my life, referring to Chavez meeting Fred Ross in 1952. That right there tells me it was a very significant event in Cesar's life. So I'm definitely gonna include it in my graphic organizer.
In 1962, Chavez left the CSO and formed a fruit pickers union, the National Farm Workers Association. By 1965, it had 1,700 member families. California grape pickers were paid about $1 an hour, which was not a living wage. From that dollar, some growers charged the workers who spent all day in the hot sun for every drink of water they took. In September 1965, workers in another union began a strike against grape owners in Delano. Chavez's union joined them. The two unions merged, forming the United Farm Workers Organizing Committee. Chavez organized church meetings, sit-ins, and even a 300-mile march of under underpaid California grape pickers. When all that failed, he called for a na nationwide boycott of California grapes. In February 1968, in protest, Chavez stopped eating. For 25 days straight, he drank only water and diet soda. His followers rallied behind him. Chavez wasn't done fighting for poor farm workers. In August 1970, he called for a boycott of lettuce. And when he refused to end the boycott, despite a court order, he was thrown in jail. In 1972, he fasted for 24 days to protest anti-union laws. He organized a massive voter registration drive that helped defeat those laws. Chavez knew that poisonous chemicals sprayed on grapevines to keep away insects were injuring farm workers. In 1987, he called for a boycott of all grapes sprayed with dangerous pesticides and fasted for 36 days in support of the boycott. In the years ahead, laws were passed to limit the use of these chemicals. Now, there's so many significant events that we can't possibly keep track of them all on our graphic organizer. So I'm going to stick with the, in 1987, he called for a boycott of all grapes um, because that was kind of the culminating boycott that led to a change in laws. So I'm gonna list that on my graphic organizer in the last box. You can go ahead and list whichever event you think was the most significant. Now, I'm gonna challenge you as you go off to do your independent reading to think about your biography that you're reading and think about how the author included significant events in that person's life and how the structure of your biography is in chronological order or the events are in the order that they happened. It's not skipping around. You're also going to, in your ELA packet, you're going to use your reading response to biography where you're going to write about what you've read. So you're going to include your biography title, what you learned about the subject of your biography, your opinion on that person. So think about the significant events and think about what kind of person is it that you're reading about and why are you coming to that conclusion about the person being that kind of person and having those character traits. And if you had to describe hmm in one person, it would be hmm because. And then this is the work I want you to send to your teacher. Today we learned how writers of biography focus on important events and that those events are listed in chronological order. As you're reading, pay attention to when meaning breaks down. If you're reading and you realize that you're not understanding what you're reading or you start to Think about something else, you can get back to this document when meaning breaks down to help you and this document about how to stay focused. Continue adding to your reading log and send this to your teacher today so that they know what you're working on. Also, I want to tell you, super exciting next week, we're going to have some guest librarians from our Tacoma Public Library who are going to read aloud a story to us and talk about how we can use the Tacoma Public Library as a resource to learn about history and historical facts. So be sure to tune in next week for that.
Thank you so much for reading and writing and thinking with me today, third graders. Now it's your five minute break, so make sure you take care of your needs, but also gather the materials that you're going to need for math, which are your whiteboard and marker, your learning buddy, and your counters. Thank you so much, have a great weekend, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.
Hi, third graders. Welcome back from your break. It is Fact Fun Friday. I did a little decorating here in my home office for you. Um, there's going to be a few more days of videos with me at home, and then I'll be back into the classroom. And I cannot wait to get back with Mr. Kevin and Miss Oslin and be able to be together with them again. So let's get started on our Fact Fun Friday. Are you ready? So what do you see here in our problem? It says 100 minus 35. Go ahead and solve that. Try and solve it in your head. See if you can use what you know about numbers to figure out an answer without having to write anything down. Awesome. What do you think the answer is? Okay, how did you get 65? Oh, well if I'm at 35, five more is 40, and 40 and 60 is 100. So it's 65. So we're gonna use what we know about this to solve the rest of our problems. So keep in your mind, 100 minus 35 is 65. You ready? What's 200 minus 35? Yeah, 165. How did you know? I'm gonna get a little bit darker color because I have a feeling that's not gonna show up very well. There we go. How did you know it was 165? What did you do? Oh, so 200 is just 100 more, right? So if I have 100 more in my hole and I don't take away anything different than I took away before, I can just add that 100 to my difference. Look at that, okay. Let's go on to the next one. Ooh, hmm. What's different about this problem and this problem? What did they do? Yeah, now it's 250. Solve that. Right, what's, thir what's 50 minus 35? 15, okay. But is 250 minus 35 15? No, it's 215, right? We kind of, we did is we broke it up into 200. This is hard to write with my mouse, but I'm doing okay today, and 50. And we said, okay, I'm gonna take 35 from this 50, and I got 15, and then I have 200 still, so I add that 200 in. So 215, nice job, third graders. Ooh, if 250 minus 35, is 215, and what's 250 minus 135? Hmm, what would that be? What, use what you know about this problem. I'm not taking away 35 anymore. I'm taking away 135. Oh, so you could just take away 100 from here. Okay, so if we do this like we did before, 200 and 50, right? You're doing this in your brain. I'm just recording it so you can see it on paper. And you take away the 35 here, that gives us 15, right? But this isn't just 35 this time, it's 135. So we also need to take away 100. So that's 15 plus. 100. So what's our answer? Yeah, 115. See how breaking apart into place values, decomposing into place values can help you with addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. That's why in kindergarten and first grade, you spent so much time decomposing numbers. Tell me all the ways to make eight. Tell me all the ways to make 15. Tell me all the ways to make 35 right? We spent so much time decomposing so that we can quickly use that information to help us solve these bigger problems. Isn't that great? 270 minus 35. What are you going to do this time? Okay, we like the idea of the hundreds and then the two-digit number. So let's do 70 minus 35. 
a 70 minus 35? 35. And then what's 200 minus 100? 100. So what's our answer? 135. Excellent work. Ta-da! Okay. Nice job with your Fact Fun Friday, friends. So remember that decomposing can help us with mental math. It helps us check our answer too and make sure it's reasonable. Yeah. Okay. So today we're going to do more practice with those multiple of 10 digits and multiplying one digit numbers by them. So I'm going to give you a problem and I'm going to give you about one minute to solve and then we're going to go over a solution together on my whiteboard. Are you ready? Here we go. It says, use any strategy to find the product three times 20 and go. put my whiteboard up. I'm also excited to get back with Mr. Kevin so I don't have to do it. Mr. Kevin can do it for me. That will be great. So here's my whiteboard. First of all, what is three groups of 20? Well, it's 20, 20, 20. Well, when I see that, I'm going to say 20, 40, 60. I know how to skip count by twos, which means I know how to skip count by 20s. So three times 20 equals 60. What did you get? Did you get 60? Nice job. All right. Now we're going to move to the next problem. I'm going to go back to me. Here I am. Okay. So we're going to do a three read of this problem. Then you're going to have some time to solve it. And then we're going to go look at some strategies different children did. And we're going to compare them to your strategies. A sports store orders four boxes of baseball caps. Each box has 40 caps. How many baseball caps does the store order? So what's happening in this problem? store has boxes of baseball caps. Is there the same amount of caps in each box? Yes. So we can use what operation if we have equal groups and a certain number of those groups? Multiplication. So what are we trying to figure out in this problem? How many baseball caps does the store order? They're needing to figure out how many did we order in these four boxes all together. What information do we know? What information do we know? Yeah, we know that there are four boxes or four groups. And each box has 40 caps. There's 40 in each group. Go ahead and solve. Use a strategy that works for you. If you're not sure, think about using base 10 block pictures to help you. 
Are you ready? Let's take a look at some different ways to approach this problem. I'm going to make myself a little bit smaller so you can see the way. Just take a look at the screen right now. What do you notice? What are you seeing in their model? And how did they get their answer? Hmm. Hmm. Oh, you're noticing they use base 10 blocks to model. How did they model it? Okay, so they've made their groups and they've definitely labeled their model, right? So we can see there's four boxes. So this much, these groups must be each box. And they even tell us four boxes of baseball caps. I love that detail. That really tells me. And what else do you notice? There's four 10 sticks in a box. There's 40 caps in each box. Okay, so it looks like they've got 40, 40, 40, 40, okay? What else do you notice? It says four groups of four tens. Four groups of four tens. Or 16 tens. Four groups of four tens is four times four tens, or 16 tens. Let's count and check and see if they were accurate. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, what is four times four? It's 16, and these are what? Tens, so there's 16 tens. So what is 16 tens? Yeah, it's 160. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 120, 130, 140, 150, 160. Do you see how using those base 10 blocks can help you even count just by 10? Or you could do 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120, 140, 160. Great. Did any of you solve it this way? Some of you solved it differently. Let's see this way. It says, you can also use factors and grouping to multiply with tens. Start with the factors from the problem. What were our factors? Get four groups of 40, or four times 40. You can write 40 as four times 10, right? So we are decomposing 40 and now creating three factors, which we did just a few lessons ago. I have four groups with four groups of 10. Look back at this picture. Four groups with four groups of 10, right? They said four groups of 40, but it is four groups of 10. So it would be four times and then four groups of 10. Well, remember, you can multiply factors in whatever order you want. So instead of doing four times 10 equals 40, if you don't know that, you can change the grouping to four times four, which you know is 16, and then do 16 times 10. And remember yesterday, we kind of had that wondering, like when you multiply by 10, it looks like you just put a zero in the ones place and that creates the new number because now you've got 16 groups of 10 and 16 tens is just like five tens, which is 50. So 16 tens, and it actually makes the number 160. Multiplying by 10 is really great because you do zero in the ones place and it creates a two, three, four, five digit number depending on what you're multiplying by. You'll learn more about that later in the year. So this also got us to 160. So let's try this out a little bit. It says below are three equal multiplication expressions from the previous page. Four times 40, four times four times 10, and 16 times 10. All three of these 
are equal expressions. Number one, you can break apart 16 into 10 plus another number. What for 16 times 10? What would we break apart 16 into? Go ahead and write this expression on your whiteboard and fill in the blank. I'm gonna go to my whiteboard and do this with you. Okay, so 16, I should use purple. 16 times 10 equals 10 plus blank. And so we're decomposing that factor. This one, 16. What are we gonna decompose it into? 10 and? Yeah, six. Now remember, we just multiply both add-ins by this factor. So then we say, oh, well that means we can multiply 10 by 10. 10 times 10. This is what we did a few days ago. And then we add 10 times six, or six times 10 they have up there. So we'll do it in their order. It's right here. So six times 10. Okay, well, let's do that math. What is 10 times 10? It's 100. What is six times 10? It's 60. What is 100 plus 60? It's 160. Oh my goodness. Look at that. So that's all the math you're doing in your head when you're solving this problem. Pretty neat, huh? So we decomposed the factor of 16. We decomposed it into a 10 plus 6, and then we multiplied each add end by 10. And we added it together and we got our answer. What I want you to do is I want you to try multiplying 60 times 8. Go ahead. 60 times 8. Hmm. Mm hmm. I'm gonna do it while you do it and then we'll compare. 60 times eight. All right, are you ready? Now, I will tell you that we are not done with this lesson, but it's oh, the lesson's almost over. So I will stop and do our affirmation for today, and then we'll pick up here next time on our next lesson. We'll add in a couple extra slides. So take a look at what I did. I did 60 times 8 is the same as 6 times 10 times 8. But I wanted to change the order because 60 times 8 was difficult for me. So I did 6 times 8 times 10. And I knew 6 times 8 was 48. And so I multiplied 48 by 10 because 10 is a friendly number to multiply by. And I got 480. Did you get 480? Nice work, friends. So I'm going to go, I'm going to speed ahead to our learning target. But don't worry, we're going to come back to this and continue working on this for our next lesson. And I won't leave this lesson until we do some more problems together. So it says, today we learned to multiply one-digit numbers with multiples of 10. If we create models or show expressions. Yeah. 
If we start using an efficient strategy, decomposing a factor, skip counting, using facts I know, we just started it. So we're going to keep working on that. And we started, we're starting to explain how we got our answer. So we're not done with this learning yet. So tomorrow, actually tomorrow's Saturday. Next week, we'll continue on with this learning. I'm not going to finish if you don't have any homework today. Unless you want to, try some of these, make up some problems for yourself on your whiteboard and play around with it a little bit. See what you understand. See what's still confusing and be ready to learn next time we do that together. All right. So it's time for our affirmation. And our affirmation today is, I am an amazing helper. I know that at home right now, you are having to help your family a lot. And it's important to remind yourself that you're doing a good job. So I'm going to go first. I am an amazing helper. Your turn. Excellent job, third graders. We will see you next week. Bye. Hey kids, we want to see your work. Just send your pictures and your stories to TV Classroom, 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405.